Good evening. If you're in the lobby, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, we're going to get started. Let me just signal them real quick. All right, um, if you were not here last week, um, we have been in the book of Revelation, and we have been doing something a little unique where we have been approaching the book like the author intends, in my opinion, and um, this is a challenge to all of us who've heard Revelation in lots of different ways. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of the end. Not the revelation of what are we going to do moving forward. Not a revelation even of heaven, although we get some of those pictures. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have been approaching the book from that vantage place of thinking of it in a Christological way. How is Christ revealed in the book? Um, and so each week, we've been kind of taking a few pieces. This will be our last week in Revelation. Um, next week, we will take a week off, and then we're going to go right into the book of Hebrews, okay? And we'll go through Hebrews until the beginning of December, and we'll finish up before the holidays. Um, so tonight... Um, like I said, if you weren't here last week, we talked about the slain lamb last week and Jesus being the slain lamb and the implications of that. Um, the biggest phrase that I felt like we came away with was that the lamb was slain and because he was slain, his model of openness is how he is revealed both in the past and the future. Um, there was messianic implications of him being an opener um, in Revelation, all throughout, he opens the seal because he is the slain lamb, a slain lamb being mortally wounded, we talked about being open. And so um, I know that a couple of people have been thinking about it a lot the last week, about what does it mean if Jesus is bleeding life all over everything? I mean, that's what it says. Um, I alluded to it last week. I've, I've been... Thinking about it even more, uh, at the end of Revelation, it talks about the Lamb is on the throne with the Lord God Almighty, and a river, right, we know this, comes from the throne of God. We all assume what? That it's a river of water. But it says that the tree of life has grown up next to it, and we talked about the blood having life in it, and it says the leaves of that tree are for the what? Healing of the nations. We are healed how? According to the scriptures, by his blood. So I was just struck in my heart to think about um, heaven is a bloody mess. And how that implies to all of us what our lives look like is to constantly be releasing life. And through our openness. So this week, we are going to keep that in the back of our mind because it's super important. Like I said last week, 28 times the most common reference to Jesus in the book of Revelation is the slain lamb. And we have to hold that intention because it's the context of what we're going to talk about this evening from Revelation chapter 19. So I'm going to read through a short passage, and then we're going to hopefully unpack it. Um, we're going to be in Revelation 19. Uh, I'm going to read verse 9 and 10 as contextual, and then our focus is going to be 11 through 16. And an angel said to me, this is to John, the revelator, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship, and he said, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. 
So that is our context for what we're about to say. See it happen. Verse 11, then I saw heaven open up and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems or crowns. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, we're going to pray, because that's a lot. To unpack tonight. Jesus, would you teach us tonight about who you say you are? It is such a mystery and a wonder to be confronted by how different you are than what we think. I pray that our hearts would be opened because the Lamb has opened up everything for us to be able to hear and experience what we're going to learn about you in this passage. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. So tonight, the kind of the title, the writer called Faithful and True, Jesus the Separator. Okay? So we had the opener last week. Jesus the opener. Jesus the Separator tonight. And we're going to unpack a few reasons why I believe he's a separator. So like I said, we read through the context. A few things to put in the back of our brain as we're moving forward in the passage is one, the context is the invitation of the supper of the Lamb. Why is this important? It's a marriage supper. So the whole idea behind this is the consummation of all of God's plans, okay? Just like in marriage, there's a consummation between bride and groom. The supper is an expression of everybody being able to take part and eat and be involved in this beautiful thing. That's important because the Lord God Almighty desires union with humanity above all else. That's really important because the reason why we're going to find out he's the separator is because he is willing to separate anything from our lives that prevents union with him. Okay? Second piece of context that's important for us the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Um, this word testimony is where we get our word witness from. It's also where we get our word martyr from. And so this testimony of Jesus being the spirit of prophecy is helping us realize that there is a witness to what God is doing prophetically in this book. Because the word prophetic or prophecy here, it literally means to reveal truth, to make clear beforehand, to foretell or foretell. So basically, we know the marriage supper of the Lamb is happening. We know that union is the goal. And now what we're going to see is the depiction of what is going to be foretold of how things are going to come to consummation. This is the end of everything, okay? So in the book of John, if you read through it, John basically retells the way the world's going to end in a number of ways, but he's not really talking about just the world. He's talking about the world in that moment in time, okay? So a lot of the language that he's using is not futuristic in full, partially, but it is talking about there is a consistent pattern all throughout history where humanity, from the garden, humanity has struggled with having connection and union with God, right? From the garden, we were, we were supposed to be in union with God. We're supposed to be in connection with God. And all throughout history, there are always things that come against us being connected to God or come against us being in union with God. And this is going to be the story of the final blow to everything that would keep you.
from union and, con and connection with God. Before we get into it any further, when you hear Jesus, the writer who is called faithful and true, this is your first discussion question, I want you to share with the people who are around you, find a group of two or three people, and I want you to answer the question, what comes to your mind when you hear the writer called faithful and true about Jesus? What's, what comes to mind? What do you think this is about? If you were to guess, what do you think this is about? What does this mean? Have you ever thought about it before? If you haven't, that's okay. Unpack maybe faithful or true. And let's see what happens. You have six minutes, seven minutes to get with a group and to unpack what does it mean for Jesus to be the writer called Faithful and True? Ready, set, go. All right, looks like you guys are doing a great job. All right, so let's unpack this just a little bit. Um, if you wouldn't mind, maybe, maybe shout out, raise your hand or something, if you have a word or two that you would like to contribute as what does the writer called Faithful and True mean to you, stick out to you, what comes to mind, what pictures, feelings, images, a night. Awesome. Somebody else. I love it. He's like the rescuer. Love that. Uh, somebody said a sheriff. I heard sheriff. The British are coming. Little Paul Revere. A messenger. Messenger. I, I was telling them, I was like, forgive my Lord of the Rings nerdiness. But I definitely had like a little bit of like Gandalf. On Shadow Facts, The White Horse, At the Top of Helm's Deep. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of that action is kind of what came into my mind when I first read it. And it's humorous and funny because that is the picture that the Jewish people would have had. 
immediately when they hear the rider who's on the white horse, who's coming, um, there, there's a couple different perspectives on the Messiah um, in that early, um, right at the turn of the century. You have like some people who think that the Messiah was going to be very priestly. And so he was going to be like robed out and like holy, holy, holy. And they felt like the Messiah was very much wired like that. And then other people were like, no, no, no. Like he's going to be like a military, like bad A, you know, who's going to like come in here and throw, overthrow Rome and kick it down. And we're going to be freed in liberation. Okay. So it's like those two pictures are kind of what's there. And so when they, they hear this, all of their immediate thoughts is like, yes, he is going to be triumphant and overcoming, but he's a slain lamb. Like you can't lose that. Because him showing up regardless of how he's appearing in this moment, he's still going to be a slain lamb. That's important in, in just a second. It is interesting to me that um, the Greek text does not use the word writer, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, they, it uses the word one who is seated or enthroned, which is very fascinating to think about. Uh, he's almost templing on top of this horse, um, identifying his kind of presence is being established on this horse. And so he's coming with his presence which I think is a little different than him coming with his fight. Um, the two words here, faithful and true, uh, I think are, are pretty straightforward, but let, let's just unpack them a little bit. Faithful, the word is pistis or pistos um, in the Greek. It's, it's basically where we get our word like fides from or faith. Um, the idea behind um, someone who is faithful is someone who is immovable and highly supportive. So it's not necessarily aggressive. So it's not like I'm a faithful person and I'm going to punch you in the face. It's more like I'm a faithful person and I'm not going to be moved. It's different, right? It's not violent. It's reliable. Great word. Great word. Reliable for faithful. Amazing. Perfect, perfect word, reliable. Second is true. Um, so in the, so there's a, a dual thing happening. Remember, Revelation is written approximately 90 AD. So we're talking almost 60 years post Christ's death. That's a big deal because the dynamic of what's happening culturally is that you have very Jewish people and very Roman Greek people in their mindsets. So there's kind of a clash of mindset that's happening. So when you're reading this as a, a first century Christian, sometimes you're getting kind of Greek pictures bleed onto you, and then sometimes you have very Hebrew pictures bleeding into your mind. And that's exactly what's happening, particularly with this word true. So in the Greek mindset, when something is true, it is real, okay? So it's reality, you know? When I say this thing is true, there is no allusion to it. There's no fakeness or hype to it. It is the realest, truest thing. Um, it is the most real. But interesting thing is that for the Hebrews, they're not thinking of something being like real in that way. They're thinking that something that is true is something that has no lies to it. Lies. So it's similar, but a little bit different because they're less focused on the reality of it and more about it has no obscurity to it, okay? So this is powerful for us because as we're thinking about it, he's coming as this writer in, in righteousness, which is in rightness in all things. Um, we kind of cheapen righteousness in the church and we make it very spiritual, like, Christ's righteousness covers the, you know, there's, there's that sense. Righteousness, if you break it down, it's simply like you know how to be in right relationship with everybody and everything all the time. Isn't that powerful? That when Christ calls us into his righteousness, all he's saying is, hey, I can teach you how to do everything right. I can teach you how to maintain right relationship with everything that exists. That's powerful. 
So he's coming in righteousness to what? Judge and make war. <laughs> I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. This was like the worst week for me. If you know me, my heart is about like gentle and lowly and meekness of the Lord and healing. Like these are my passions. And I'm like, he judges and makes war? Like I don't like this. And most of us don't because it's really uncomfortable to think about what does it mean for him to judge. The word judge, and I think this is really kind of the driving heart behind everything tonight, which is why I call this Jesus the separator, is because when something is judging, what they're doing is literally separating things or distinguishing things or deciding things. When the idea of judgment comes, it's less about pronunciation of guilt and more about separating something that is or isn't. It's a decision. It's pretty arbitrary based on the judge, not on anything else. It's based on how he would separate something. When I was reading this, immediately, much like we talked about slain lamb being slain before the foundation of the earth and how because his blood was shed before everything existed, he could create all things and he could open everything up because that's who he is. The identity of Jesus being a judge is all the way back in Genesis 1. If you go to Genesis 1, you read verse 4, verse 6, verse 14, you see in creation he separates things. He separates things. See, we always think that the way God does stuff is he's always creative. Wow, look, he spoke a word and light came in. But then he separates things. And so he's like, hey, this water can't be from this water. That's, what, that's one of the things that he separates. He separates light from dark. And he separates day from night. So there's this deeply inherent reality to how God is working in the earth, that he is always looking to create delineations between things that are opposites. Does that make sense? He's drawing a line between opposites. Can you imagine what it would be like if there was no line between day and night? It's intense. He does this for our flourishing. All of those passages about light and dark, the heavenly waters, which would be like rain, earthly waters, like the sea. All of these things are connected to rhythms. All of these things are related to how we process time, seasons. Without separation, we would just feel like everything's permanent in our world. But we need a new day, amen? <laughs> We need yesterday to be gone and today to be new. We need for the water cycle to come around that we have rain when there's drought and we don't just have an ocean filled with water. That doesn't help dry places. We need that separation to create pattern and rhythm for us to flow and function and that's why he separates. So at the end of all things, he's coming to separate what is he coming to separate? We're going to get to that in a second because we're going to talk about him making war now. Make war, contend, battle, fight, etc. It's all basic. You know, it's where we get our word polemic or polemical from. It's the same word in Greek here to make war. So if somebody's being polemical, that means they're just starting a war, aka politicians. Um, <laughs> which we don't need any more wars because he's, he's doing it. He's better at it than we are. Um, the war that's happening, man, there's so much. There is a war in the book of Revelation that is happening between basically good and evil. Uh, you get the serpent who's showing up as a dragon from Genesis 1, same kind of serpent, dragon picture. You get a beast that shows up. Um, you get all of these nasty nations that show up, like Babylon and Rome. 
that are really, really good at starting war <laughs> and making a mess of everything and ruining everybody's separations and, and trying to make conformity and, and bring everything together, but really all they do is separate in a bad way and not a good way. And Jesus, when he shows up in this moment, there's some descriptions that come out about him that reveal his approach to war and judgment. The first is that he has eyes like flames of fire. Some people love to be like, oh, it's eyes burning with love. <laughs> if you read Song of Songs, it is. Um, what his eyes are burning with is that he is burning through everything that is between you and him. He's separating and seeing through every wall, every barrier. He's seeing through that with his eyes of fire. It is a discerning eye. It is an eye that causes for everything that is hidden to be revealed. That's intense. That's how he's coming. He's also coming with a head of diadems, of, of crowns. He's coming to show you he is a better king than the beast and the serpent and the Caesars of the day. The pattern in Revelation recurs. So it talks about Babylon and Rome and a few other nations in the Old Testament. But the writer is really talking about, in, in scholarly nerdy places, they call a lot of the prophetic apocalyptic language, it, it's something called census plenier which means there's kind of a, a picture of what's happening in the moment that you have to look at, and then there's also a big picture happening simultaneously. So in this moment, Rome is bad news. So they're all like hearing it as like Rome is bad news, but they're also going, we've heard about bad news before, like Babylon. Babylon was really bad news. There's other books that um, Edom comes up, uh, which if you don't remember, Edom is the nation that's built up out of Esau. Um, who is a baddie in the Old Testament, um, because basically he is always warring against his brother Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, so there's always a war. Again, you see what happens when the Lord is not making war? We make war. It's a dangerous position to think that we are allowed to make war. So he, when he says he has diadems on his head, it's basically highlighting that he is a better Caesar he is a better Lord. He is a better king than any of these places have ever had. Way better. And it's, it's important. A name that no one knows, um, this is to remind us and challenge us that it is ultimately a mystery how God is working in the earth. <laughs> he separates things that I don't understand why he separates them. I don't know what name he's going to come in that day. Um, and he it says only he's the one who knows that day how he's showing up. But this is important for us because there is a certain level of trust in his faithfulness and trueness and how he's separating things, which is really helpful for us to embrace. Verse 13, guys, this is fascinating to me. His robe is dipped in blood. Now, last week we talked about the bloody mess of the lamb. A lot of people in my life have taught this as if this is the blood of what? The people he's overcoming. At this point, there is no battle that has happened. I think it's his blood. I think it's his blood. I think that he is dripping with his blood as he comes to be the judge, the separator, the rider. And he's not coming to make blood. He's already done it which is fascinating to me, um, that if that's the case, what is the battle really about then? Too many of us think that fighting battles and fighting wars are about winning, about overcoming, about dominating, about shedding blood. But here, he's clothed in a robe dipped with blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is what he's doing battle with. The word of God. Why? Because the passage says that it come, a sword comes up out of his mouth. This is not a physical sword where he's, Jesus is not hacking people to pieces. 
He's come, and it's funny because he's not just come to have a truthful sword because, listen, we love somebody waving around a truth sword. I'm just telling the truth in love, brother, as I chop you to pieces. I'm just being honest. The amount of times I've heard people say, like, I'm just speaking the truth in, bro- in love, brother. And I'm like, no, you're hacking people to death. You're not the king. You don't get to do that. It's funny because it says that he is the word of God. John 1 and 1 John 1, this is direct language John the Revelator is pulling from. And what does the word do? The word becomes flesh, comes and dwells among us. It, it is embodied truth. You wage war when you become like Jesus and embodying his truth, not your truth. And his truth is what? Well, in the passage, it's very, very clear what his truth is there to do. It is to separate. It's to separate every single thing that would keep you from him. His sword is coming to slay every part of you that is not cool with being one with him. Every enemy Because listen, we know we're not fighting against flesh and blood. According to Ephesians, it's principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. The word of the Lord, the sword that comes out of his mouth is to deal with the lies and the deceptions that would prevent us from union with the lamb. Yes, sir. Correct. The nations that we're talking about is not just the nations of the world. He's specifically talking about the Romes, the Babels, the Edoms that are what? Representative of ideologies that prevented the people of God from coming to God. Esau is one of them. Babel, (laughs) Tower of Babel. Literally, the Lord, what does he have to do? He separates humans in that moment. He changes all their languages. He separates them. He separates Esau and Jacob from each other. Why? Because they would have killed each other if they were together. This is his way to deal a blow to things that would prevent us from coming closer to him. It goes on to say, and to your point, Jeff, strike down the nations, rule them with the rod of iron, tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. That is all taken directly out of Isaiah 63. It's literally like word for word. So in their mind, it's a messianic expectation that they believe that the Christ is going to do these kinds of things. Now, they're thinking of it as what? He's going to militaristically do it. (laughs) But we already said that. He's not coming militaristically. He's coming to deal by bringing truth into all the lies, all the deception, and all the hiddenness that keeps us from him. To be honest with you, I think that that is a worse war. I'd rather die physically than the Lord to come up and just separate the marrow and the sinews from me. Are you kidding me? You know, Hebrews 4 says that the word of God, right, that's what he's called here, literally can separate between all of the parts of you. It's quick and active. That's intense. It's like... A doctor who's really good with a scalpel. That he can remove anything that's preventing life and healing. He died to give you life. And so now he's like, now I'm going to do all the other work. I made a way for life to come. Oh, you got, you got a blockage here. Stint that thing up. See what I'm saying? Oh, we got a little bit of a nasty toe over here. Chop that thing off. Regrow it. You know, this Jesus' style. Separate so that the pattern is not continued of lies and deception and deceit and illusion and hiddenness. He's breaking in to bring life and light and wholeness back into our existence. It's interesting because last week we talked about Micah chapter 2. Um, there was a messianic expectation that the breaker would come. (laughs) We talked a little bit about breakthrough and that he's coming to open everything up. I I went back and was reading it, and Micah chapter 2, the context is Edom. It's Esau. 
It's saying that I'm going to break them out of living in the land of Esau because the city that they talk about in Micah 2, Basra, means sheepfold. So he's coming into Esau to break open the, the sheepfold that's stuck so that they can all come back to the relationship that they need to have. That's so powerful. The question that I want to encourage you to ask with your group right now is what are the areas that the Lord wants to wage war on your life? What are the things that he's coming for to separate out of you, to be closer to him, to be able to eat with him at the supper of the lamb? All right, seven minutes.
All right. Listen, I, it, was, it was funny for me as I was, like, processing through this, you know, what has he come to wage war on? Uh, it just, it changed, like, my mind on so many things throughout Scripture where, like, a battles and, you know, like, I don't know why I was thinking about David and Goliath, right? I'm like, oh, man, it's an epic battle and, you know, I want to be like David, right? Or it's like Daniel versus Belteshazzar and, you know, it's like, I want to stand and be like Daniel. And I'm like, man... I actually just want the Lord to come and fight the war. Like, I'd rather just be the stone in the story, you know? What if I'm just the sling in this thing? He just throws me around and something cool happens. It's not a fair fight. It's not. It's not a fair fight because no money. And money... And he's nailed it on the head. That's actually like my next point. <laughs> Thank you, Money, for being the grand segue master. There, there is no enemy. Let me ask you this. Let's just say the good and the bad. Yes, sir. Let's just say that for the good and the bad. If he separates the good from the bad, is that? Let's All right. Say So, one of the things that, in the research that I was doing, it, if we keep reading in 19, we get the big scary passage, right? The, the lake of fire. It's terrifying. I feel like it's terrifying. When the Lord comes in this moment, and there's no battle in the realm of the enemy left, because we know. It, it, if you go on to read how, he's, how the enemy's defeated, they all line up for battle, but there's actually not a fight. Go read it. In the rest of 19, there's actually not a fight. Why? Because the lamb slain already won. There's no need for battle. It's kind of like ceremonial of sorts. Of like, and you're a loser. You know, like, it's really that straightforward. And it's crazy, though, because... Part of what happens in this section is he talks about, like, false prophets and those who are deceived. If you go back and you hear the stories of Rome, you hear the stories of Babel, you hear the stories of Esau, you hear all of those stories that are aberrant to the way God has for us to live. It's people who have chosen their way over the way of the king. So there's a rebellion and the, the whole purpose of this battle is to say rebellion can't even bring separation. Because we know the enemy of our souls brought division and separation, which was not his job to do. Only the king was to be the separator. But he brought a separation in heaven, you know, according to the scriptures. He, you know, robs a group of, you know, angels, comes to earth, thrown to earth, however you want to process it. There's a lot to that. We can talk about that. But the idea is that the mindset of rebellion being an option is ultimately what is separated out. A hundred percent. Independence is another word. And I think what it's telling us with this faithful and true writer is that... In order for you to live in truth, in order for you to live in faith, it comes to the position where you have to confess the same thing that he confesses. If you go back and you read, the early church was so established on confession. And everyone immediately seizes up. <laughs> confession. What are we, Catholic? I mean, it's like... It's so funny. I'm telling you, this word is a trigger word for us. Why? Because confession means we actually have to own that we have been rebellious. We have separated when it was not our job to separate. 
We have judged and made war when we are not ever supposed to wage war or judge. It's a big deal. So it's like this moment becomes a moment of repentance, I think, for us. I think the revelation of Jesus calls for repentance on our part of saying, I have attempted to be the rider. I've attempted to be the rider. The creeds? Like the first one's like 300 something, 225, I think. Much later. In this, in this time period, the only kind of creed they're saying is Jesus is Lord. That's like the most common one. That, that's what they're getting martyred for. They're being a witness to the writer who's faithful and true. Spirit of prophecy, Jesus, there's a witness. When you were saying, hey, I am calling Jesus the Lord and King. Caesar is not. You know, that's, when, that's when that happens um, in this time period. But the confession to me... You know, the word confession means, it literally, it's homo legato. Homo, like, is where we get, like, homo, stasis, things like that. Um, there, there's this sense that it's the same. And then you get legato, which is where we get our word, word, logos from. So it's to be the same as the word. That's confession. To say the same word as the writer who is faithful and true, who has a word in his mouth because he's embodiment of truth. And when his embodiment of truth shows up, it wages war on all of our silk screens. All of our cute little things that we've created for our lives. He comes to wage war on everything that we put on the stage but him. All of our rebellion, all of our duplicity. And he's like, hey, I just actually want you without all of that stuff. Yes, sir. So, I mean, most think that, that it's, again, this is a vision, friends. This is a vision, okay? I know that we believe in visions, but it's a vision still, so everything is not reality the way we're experiencing it. Um, most, most say that that word that's coming out of his mouth is is himself like he's coming out of his own mouth um, much like we, we see in Hebrews um, that it is the word of God it's the, the thing about the word of God if you go into the Old Testament uh, you'll, you'll like this um, the Hebrew word for word is devar and when we say word in English we're like like we're like this is a word this is a word Look at these four letters, word, <laughs> yay. This is super like Greek and, and Roman mindset. When you get down to, the bar uh, in Hebrew, what, what happens is it's not just a word, it is in that activity it is an event. It, it is like a whole diorama. It's like a whole stage. So it's like when Jesus is like, oh, I'm coming up as the word. I'm not just coming up as like four letters. I'm actually coming up with my whole stage of the universe and saying, come, be on this stage with me. Sword of the Spirit, the word of God. Again, if you want to talk about spiritual warfare, what is the best way to see everything change is by you embodying the stage that he presents himself on or the, the scheme or the kingdom. I hate to use those churchy words because we get church. But it, it is that real reality of Jesus shows up with the whole kit and caboodle and he's like, hey, you can come sit on this thing with me and you can be part of this beautiful drama that I am like unfolding. That's kind of the best way I can explain it. It's like, he, it's like he rolled up, you know, the Kennedy Center and he's like, this is me. Come, be on my stage. I'm, I'm casting all of you. 
And the only way you can be cast in this is if you give up your little neighborhood stage that you're trying to do everything on. You can't act there and act here. Give all that up. Only here. Um, I'm going to close with this. Man, the Lord is funny how he brings these things up. I wasn't planning on talking about the stage thing. Um, Seven years ago, um, I was at a university working as a campus pastor, and very intensely, the Lord was like, hey, I want you to talk about revival for a whole year. And I literally said to the Lord, I don't use that word. Um, It's so fake and so hyped up, and no one even knows what it means, so I'm not using that word. Literally, I said that to the Lord. I'm very honest with him. He can handle it. He's the truth. Um, and in that moment, he said, do you even know what it means? And I'm like, nope. Uh, unless you want to talk about, like, resuscitating a dead thing, you know. So he's like, as always, you guys know me, go look it up, Jason. Always. Go look it up. I'm not done. Oxford etymology of the word revival. So when we talk about revival in church settings, um, the origination of that word for religious spaces, Cotton Mather. Anybody know Cotton Mather? Cotton Mather. Go go do some homework. Read about Cotton Mather. He used the word to talk about a religious awakening within a community of people in the northern part of, of the United States of America. Okay? You can go read about it. He used it in that religious way, and since then, it's been continued in religious communities. Before that... Outside of the one usage of the act of reviving, there's only one other usage from 1500, uh, from like before the 1500, I think 200 years before Cotton Mather uses it, something crazy like that. I'm terrible with numbers, great with words. Uh, Just honestly, truthfully, I'm like, ah, hundreds something. Bible verses, I don't know. It's in that book on that page, like, um, It is used to talk about an old play that is being done in a new way in a theater space. You've probably heard people say there is a Broadway revival of that show. And when I heard that, I was shook to my core because I realized that all God is trying to do is show up again and again and again throughout history to say it is the same play in a new way every single time. It is the same play before the foundation of the world. It is the same play in Genesis chapter 1. It is the same play in Exodus, the Paschal Lamb. It is the same way when Jesus shows up on the scene. It's the same way today. For us to have revival is just to realize that God is still doing the same thing he's always done, which is to come for our puny and weak little stages. And he's going to smash them to blitherings so that his stage can be there and you can be with him. And if you don't want to be on his stage, that's fine. You're just not going to be in the good nest. Your rebellion can keep you separated. But he is going to draw a line and say, you're either on this stage with me or you're not. It was fascinating because in the vision that I had of all of this, um, I have weird visions I saw all these great, significant people in the church in that time period, famous people like T.D. Jakes and um, all these different people were on the stage. And I was like, whoa, look at all those people on the stage. And the Lord said, take them all off the stage. Whoa, what? And I walked up on the stage and I realized they were all just cardboard cutouts. And he goes, can you clear them all off so that I can be the star of the show? There's a danger that we have in the church, that we're still believing that revival is going to come because we put somebody up on the stage. The only way revival ever happens is if Jesus is center stage. And no one else. And his invitation is, hey, will you come and center the whole play of your life around me and my play? Because it's the best play. Because you always get healed. You always get redeemed. You always get restored. You always get on, invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb who died so you could live every time, again and again and again. And I'm, I believe that he's going to continue to do it. Because of the stage language. That, the stage language when I was explaining it. The stage language. 
No, sir. It's just that, that is what the word showing up, like a writer. It's like he's, he's brought the whole kingdom. It's funny. If you read the story, it says, and all of these people are following him on a what? A white horse dressed the same way as him. Why? Because they're background actors. <laughs> they're all doing what he's doing because that's how the play is seen the most is when all of us are just modeling ourselves after it. Jesus the separator, the writer who's called faithful and true. So I want to give you guys just a few minutes, like three or four minutes, to pray with each other. And we're going to just pray radical prayers. We're going to pray, one, that Jesus shows up in the center of your stage. Maybe you feel like in this season he's been to the side. He's on the side of the stage or he's on the back of the stage. Or maybe you feel like he's in the audience and he's watching everything, but he's not in the center. We're going to ask Jesus if he come and be the center of the stage again. And number two, we're going to ask him, hey, what's on the stage that needs to be struck? If you go back and you read about theater, they call it striking the stage when you empty it off. He came to what? Strike the nations to clear it all out so that he could be the only thing left. So we're going to ask for those two things, that the Lord would highlight to you the things this week that you need to strike, and two, that you would invite Jesus to center stage, wherever he might have been in your life currently. Hey, Jesus, would you come be center stage? Would you show me a better play than I've known before? All right? I'm going to pray, bless you, and then you pray together. Jesus, I pray that you would reveal all of the things that need to be struck from our stages. Man, we do a good job of being great cutouts on your stage. But Lord, I pray that you would strike all of the versions of ourselves that we've presented so that only you would be seen. And that instead we could just be like the wonderful crowd that's behind the writer and we're just mimicking you. We're just like mirrors of you to the earth. That they would be like, man, who is that man? And you're like, well, the one I'm looking at, it's not me. It's the one I'm looking at. And Jesus, would you be invited to our stage today? Wherever we might feel like you are or aren't. Jesus, we even ask you that if you've been in the balcony way, 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 way far back, that you would walk all the way to the middle of the stage. Lord, if you're hiding in the orchestra pit in our minds, Lord, I pray that, they, that you'd come to center stage and that you would bring the greatest story ever to our hearts and our minds that all lives would be separated away from us and only the faithful and true would reign. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray with your groups and then we bless you to leave.